Our next speaker uh, this afternoon is Dr. Robert Herrain, uh, who is a postdoctoral research associate for the Gambling Treatment and Research Clinic and the Technology Addiction Team based at BMC. Uh, his research is focusing on preventing and reducing the harms associated with online gambling. Uh, he also undertakes meta scientific research with the goal of improving the quality of research in the addictions field, uh, focusing on the adoption of open science practices and the need for replication studies in the field. Uh, he's going to talk to us today about leveraging online gambling account data to improve consumer protection. So I'd like to welcome Rob. Thanks, Leanne. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Leanne mentioned, I'm going to be talking about some research that I've been conducting over the last couple of years in the field of online gambling. But rather than dig down into the specifics uh, of each individual study, I'm going to try and provide a, a high level overview of the research we've been doing uh, and the methods we've been using to try and advance the understanding of this area. So to give you some background context, Australians gamble more per person per year than any other country in the world by quite some significant margin, uh, more than double most countries in the world. And it's estimated that there are over a million gamblers who are either at risk of or are currently experiencing gambling related problems in Australia. And online gambling in particular presents a number of new concerns. So for example, people can gamble in private. We no longer um, have to gamble around our peers where potentially there are social cues which can discourage us from excessively gambling. We can now gamble anywhere at any time, thanks to our mobiles. We don't have to be in a casino or in a club. And we can make instantaneous digital payments and we're no longer hindered by how much cash we're carrying at any one time, like we would be with more traditional in-venue forms of gambling. But despite all of these additional concerns associated with online gambling, there are also a number of uh, unique opportunities associated with it, both in terms of the potential for research and the potential for developing new interventions that can um, that can reduce and risk, risky gambling behavior. So for example, we can monitor objective behavioral data for gambling over time using uh, the information contained in their account data. We can see how often people are gambling, how much they're gambling, what they're gambling on and what times of day they're gambling. We can intervene while somebody's gambling and evaluate the impact of that based on this behavioral data. And we can also then look to connect self-report survey responses with this objective behavioral data. And I'll come back to each of these three points throughout the presentation. Uh, but historically, despite these opportunities, most gambling researchers have relied on online simulated uh, gambling experiments and self-reported gambling behavior to be able to, to study this area. And that's until recently when these online gambling companies, particularly in Australia, have realized that the value in improving their safer gambling practices and policies and engaging with researchers like ourselves at the BMC. And as a result of this shift in perspective over the last two years, uh, myself and colleagues have been able to perform a under, number of different studies with six online wagering sites in Australia. Uh, and this has allowed us to provide a whole new understanding and, and perspective on online gambling in Australia that was previously inaccessible. So for example, touching on the first area, the first thing we did was to look at um, extracting an anonymized account data for a very large sample of 40,000 customers in Australia. And we wanted to know how many of these customers actually use the responsible gambling tools or consumer protection tools that these sites offer them to hopefully help them gamble in a more sustainable way. Um, so what we found is that actually only less than 20% of, of people use these tools and most people just use this one tool, what's called a deposit limit, which is a limit on how much money you can deposit into your account over any specified period of time, say $100 a week or $20 a day. And most people don't yet then use these other tools that are offered to them that all involve in some way temporarily deactivating one's account for, or permanently deactivating one's account. And what we were also able to show by monitoring the uptake of these tools over time for one operator, you can see here that for the latter half of 2018 and the early part of 2019, there were only about five limits being set per month of all of the customers of this operator. What we can see is that then in 
May 2019, when the Australian government implemented a policy which required all online gambling sites to, to make their customers either actively opt out of setting a limit or set a limit on their account, there was this real precipitous increase in the number of people setting these limits, which suggests that this kind of opt out scheme um, is useful in this context and could be useful for encouraging the use of other tools and useful in other countries. And we were also able to show that actually lots of people that do set these limits actually go on to um, decrease or increase the limit amount, so making it less restrictive or removing it altogether. And again, this suggests that potentially we need to increase the friction required to make these changes or consider a site global level limit that applies to all customers of say $1,000 a month, for example, like they've set in uh, several European countries. We we're also able to perform a randomized control trial of simple messages, just encouraging these customers to set a deposit limit on their account. Uh, and what we found was that these very simple messages led to, to small but notable increases in the number of people setting these limits compared to a control group that weren't setting them, uh, of just under 1% of the sample. Uh, that might not seem like a lot, but when we translate that into the number of customers, that's thousands of people as a result of a very, very simple message that's uh, inexpensive as well for these companies to send. And what we said, found was that actually the type of message, whether somebody received one of these three, three messages, it didn't really matter. All that mattered was whether the message was, uh, the way the message was communicated to them. So whether via email or in account pop-up message, the latter being more effective at encouraging this behavior. Um, and what we showed that was that the people who set these limits in response to our messages, they actually went on to reduce their gambling behavior as well. So we can see in these graphs, we have limit setters, the people who set the limits and the people that didn't in each of these. And the yellow is pre-message and the blue post-message. And we can see that limit setters significantly reduced the amount they were spending every day. The variation in the spending, which is an in indicator of problem gambling, how much they were losing and how often they were gambling significantly more so than the people who didn't have a limit. And more recently, one of our uh, very simple, but I think interesting studies, we were able to determine how accurate people are when they're self-reporting their recent gambling behavior and outcomes. So we asked around 600 customers from one of these gambling sites to tell us over the last 30 days, how much they'd either won or lost, and how many times they'd gambled over that 30 day period. And then we compared their responses with the actual values as obtained from the gambling site. As you can see in this first graph for the outcome, most people seem to think they're doing a lot better than they actually are. So many people think they're winning, but they're actually losing, or they underestimate how much they're losing by. And similarly with betting frequency, most people seem to underestimate the number of bets they're placing. And this has really important uh, implications for both our understanding of why people might experience problems with their gambling and also for developing appropriate interventions in this area, which can hopefully target this discrepancy and provide people with a better understanding of how much they are winning or losing by. So that's all I've got time for in this very brief presentation, but this is these are just a few of the studies that we're conducting in this area. And if anybody is interested, please feel free to, to get in touch. And thank you very much for listening. Wow, what an interesting presentation, Rob. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you. One is just a broad question from your first slide. Why is it that Australia like it's more than double the US, for example? Um, it just doesn't make sense to me, that, that figure. Why is Good question. That? I'm sure there's a very complicated answer to this, um, and I'm actually a UK national, so, so maybe I'm not the best placed person to ask. Um, but gambling in Australia um, is legal in many forms that it isn't in some jurisdictions or some areas. Online gambling was only recently made legal in, in many parts of the US, for example. Um, and a more, I guess, intangible explanation I, I would say as a UK national is that it's very much part of the, the culture here as compared to many other countries for when it comes to things like horse racing, horse racing and clubs which again aren't present in, in many other countries like the UK and the US. The other question I had, thank you for that, the other question I had was just about you know this idea of behavioural control and I work in traumatic brain injury and rehabilitation and a lot of what 
we do and I do in communication therapy is awareness of behavior and and having the, the person have better awareness of what they're doing and once once you get that awareness then you can you know proactively help them um, develop new behaviors that are that are more positive and I was just thinking obviously that that study you had where you were giving uh, people quotes to to remind them about their behaviors um, is one way I was wondering if there are other ways where you're able to because people obviously aren't aware um, of how much or they're not processing how much they're gambling and how much they're losing so I was just wondering if that um, if there if there are other ways to highlight people's awareness of, of, of what they're doing while they're doing it yeah so there are um, there are statements that you can provide that, that these kind of online gambling sites provide their customers so they give them an overall view of their bets and but they don't give them these these summaries these like how how much are you winning or losing by they just get a list and you can then even go and download a spreadsheet if you actually know where to search for it which is quite difficult um, yeah. and that again you can download but it's really difficult for anybody who's not mathematically inclined to calculate what your outcome is because there are many deposits over time so there's often no dates in the, in the spreadsheet to help you work out over a period of time for example how much you've lost or won um, and it also doesn't very clearly say when you won or sorry when you lost money as well it just kind of seems to just include the, the stake of the bet um, so there are um, there is a movement at the moment to push for for better communication of these outcomes in Australia and what are, you know, what are called activity statements, which are these, these summaries of people's bet in history, hopefully with those overall summary values included. Mm. Well, that's really interesting. So thank, thank you very much for your presentation.